Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to uh, welcome all comrades and friends to this afternoon's online public meeting that has been organised by the Committee for Public Education, which is titled, as you can see, COVID-19 spreads through Australian schools, lives before profit. Uh, my name is Patrick O'Connor. I'm a public school teacher, a member of the CFPE, and also a national committee member of the Socialist Equality Party. Uh, thanks to those people who've used the chat box to let us know where you're connecting from. And if you are in the education sector, let us know in what capacity you're, you're working. Um, I'd like to begin today by outlining how we're planning on proceeding throughout the course of this meeting, uh, which is slightly different from previous meetings that we've had for those of you who've been in attendance previously. Uh, after I make some very brief introductory remarks, an initial report is gonna be given by Evan Blake, who's a member of the Socialist Quality Party in the United States. Uh, so we're very, very pleased to have Evan with us this evening. His time, this afternoon hours, uh, Edwin is a regular writer for the World Social website, and he's the coordinator of the Global Workers' Inquest into the COVID-19 pandemic, an inquest that's been initiated by the World Social website. On November 21, a statement initiating the Global Inquest was posted on the World Social website. It explained, quote, drawing upon the research of scientists, the knowledge of public health experts, and the real world experience of working people and students, the inquest will investigate and document the disastrous response of governments, corporations, and the media to the outbreak of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. It will seek to expose the political and economic forces and interests that drove the policies that allowed the uncontrolled transmission of the virus and its development into a catastrophic pandemic that has killed millions worldwide." End quote. Now this inquest is of enormous historical significance. It's of enormous significance for students, school workers, uh, others around the world, as Evan's report will detail. Uh, after his report, I'm going to open it straight up for discussion and especially questions focusing on the global inquest. Uh, we're going to proceed in this way because due to time zones and other issues, uh, Evan is only able to, hit, able to participate in the meeting for the first hour. Uh, so we're going to use the first 60 minutes of the meeting to hear the, his report and then encourage everyone to take advantage of this really important opportunity and pose any questions you have following his report. Um, after that, we're going to take two additional reports focusing on the situation in the schools here in Australia. Uh, these reports will be given by Sue Phillips and Zach Hamidis, uh, both of whom I'll introduce more fully later in the meeting. After those two reports, we'll again open up the meeting for discussion. Uh, if there are any questions on those reports, they can, of course, be asked. Uh, but we also strongly encourage uh, everyone here to speak, uh, share your experiences, whether that's as a teacher, school worker, uh, some other education worker or as a parent or student. Uh, we are going to conclude the meeting then with uh, several announcements as well as two resolutions that we have drafted for adoption at this meeting. Now we're about to enter the third year of the global COVID-19 pandemic and the situation is getting worse, not better. The official figures are now worldwide in the millions, uh, hundreds of thousands in individual countries including the United States, hundreds of thousands of deaths, not just cases. The emergence of the highly transmissible Omicron variant was predicted by many epidemiologists and the World Social website. It was predicted as an inevitable price that would be paid for the failure of the ruling elite of nearly every country in the world to advance policies aimed at the elimination of the virus. Learning to live with the virus, so-called, means enduring new and dangerous variants that potentially undermine the effectiveness of the vac vaccines that international scientists have developed. This is the policy of so-called herd immunity, a policy that was initially associated with the most extreme right-wing political figures around the world, including Donald Trump, Boris Johnson, Jair Bolsonaro, but which now is embraced everywhere outside of China, including by uh, supposedly centre-left uh, governments. In Australia, there is unanimous agreement within the political establishment that the previous zero COVID conditions will never return. There will be no elimination policy and no further lockdowns or health restrictions that impinge on the operations of big business and finance capital. Now, since the beginning of the pandemic, the Committee for Public Education has demanded the coordinated suspension of the education system, including primary and secondary schools, universities, tertiary education institutions, and childcare centres. We've demanded this measure, uh, cessation of face-to-face -face teaching and learning, as an emergency step to prevent the further step of COVID-19. The CFBE has also called on teachers and school workers in Australia to form action committees independent of the trade unions and develop the widest democratic discussion on the necessary measures to protect the health and well-being of education workers and students. 
And this meeting forms a really important part of this developing discussion, uh, which really takes on a really critical uh, urgency in this situation. With those remarks, I would like to throw straight to uh, Comrade Evan Blake uh, so that he can speak on the workers inquest that's been initiated by the World Socialist website. And then I again encourage everyone to uh, use this really important opportunity to pose as many questions as you have about that issue uh, to him this afternoon. So a very warm welcome to uh, Evan. Well, thank, thank you, Patrick. And uh, thank you everyone for um, inviting me to, to speak at today's meeting of the uh, Committee for Public Education. Um, as Patrick said, my name is Evan Blake. I'm a member of the Socialist Equality Party and a writer for the World Socialist website. And I uh, used to teach uh, special education in uh, California. Uh, now I, I live in Michigan and uh, write for, for the WSWS. Um, but I, I wanted to start uh, by, uh, or I, I'll, I'll get to um, the, the uh, issues of the, the inquest. Uh, and I want to, I'll, I'll speak on the situation with the pandemic here in the US, but I wanted to just begin by um, reviewing the, the present state of the pandemic uh, and the, the spread of the, the Omicron variant. On the screen here, uh, we see uh, the two um, you know, most recent uh, variants uh, that, have, that, are, uh, that have swept the globe. There's uh, Omicron on the right and, and Delta on the left. Uh, we see in, in, uh, in red, the high degree of mutations uh, present on the, uh, the Omicron variant. And uh, I think uh, just over the past two weeks, uh, it's become very clear uh, that we've entered a new and far more dangerous uh, stage in the pandemic. Uh, Omicron has now been sequenced uh, at least 63 countries uh, throughout the world uh, on every habitable continent. Uh, and it's spreading exponentially in South Africa, uh, the UK and Denmark, uh, which conduct more uh, DNA sequencing than uh, other countries. And uh, it's, it's forecast to become the dominant variant globally in the coming weeks. Uh, and this is all uh, taking place under conditions in which the sixth global surge of the, uh, of the pandemic had already been underway uh, since, uh, since last month. Uh, and the, the bulk of infections continue to be due to the, the Delta variant, uh, which has really uh, wreaked havoc, uh, particularly throughout the Northern hemisphere um, during, this, during this time. Uh, and you know, it's it's just I'll get into it further, but I think the um, the situation right now I think is really uh, incredibly dire and really uh, you know I think I think global society is really in for a tremendous uh, shock uh, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, there were uh, there have been statements made that uh, in the UK uh, by Christmas there could be as many as one million uh, new infections per day, uh, and the, um, you know, the, like I said, the, the sequencing is not taking place uh, in, in many countries, uh, so we don't know the exact level of uh, community transmission or how prevalent Omicron is, uh, but it is, you know, it, it's quickly taking hold and uh, is really threatening to overwhelm uh, healthcare systems uh, internationally. Uh, so this, this slide shows the, uh, the number of uh, daily new confirmed cases uh, per million people, uh, and we see uh, the uh, the previous uh, waves of the pandemic uh, that they've gone through in in South Africa, um, and really the uh, the high the really in, you know incredible spread that's uh, taking place right now. Uh, and I think you know what's what's happened in South Africa really portends what will happen internationally, uh, in particular in uh, the under underdeveloped countries. Uh, the level of daily new cases has risen uh, from an average of 420. Uh, three weeks ago uh, to now, uh, or as of yesterday, it was uh, 22,388 uh, daily, daily new cases. And the test positivity rates uh, have been highly elevated. They don't have enough tests to uh, uh, get an adequate sense of uh, really how many people are infected. So there's thousands uh, that are going um, un undetected every, every day. Uh, this slide shows the growth in hospitalizations. It's only for the um, the uh, or sorry, it's it's uh, showing the the first two weeks of the uh, third and fourth wave, and I think this uh, really underscores sort of the you know one of the most um, sort of horrific uh, indices of the Omicron variant, which is that uh, it's it's uh, having a disproportionate impact on on children, uh, and we've seen that 
uh, children under five are uh, experiencing the second highest rate of hospitalization uh, in, in South Africa, uh, and infants under uh, two years old account for roughly 10% of all uh, hospitalizations uh, there, at least for the, the, um, the first the last week the, uh, during the, the uh, major uptick of the, the surge. On Monday, uh, South Africa's health minister stated that there has been a sharp increase in the number of uh, babies, uh, toddlers, and pregnant women uh, in hospital who uh, require oxygen. And uh, I think, you know, if these um, if these figures continue to uh, to hold and in South Africa and, and globally, I think that uh, that shift or the the uh, growing um, impact on children will you know produce a, a you know a really um, you know, produce a major shift in, in social consciousness and, you know, really uh, propel, you know, more, more and more workers into struggle. And I think, you know, the working class is not going to accept, uh, you know, mass levels of hospitalization and, and death of, you know, of their children, um, which we have, you know, we have seen that to, to a great extent during the pandemic. Um, but I think the, the dangers that are posed are, are um, quite stark. And there's actually, there was a, uh, a tweet earlier today, which um, showed that the that COVID nineteen has actually become the the number one uh, cause of death among children, uh, excluding um, accidents and other you know non uh, disease related uh, deaths. Um, so I, I think you know the the uh, the impact on children has just been uh, really terrible and and uh, threatens to you know to vastly uh, or to become far more uh, severe in, in the in the coming weeks and months. And uh, I think in response to this really dire situation, just the uh, the the uh, the role that the corporate media and official uh, scientists have played has just been absolutely criminal. Uh, here we see doctors uh, Anthony Fauci and Rochelle Walensky, uh, who are the top official scientists uh, here in the U.S. Uh, and over the past two weeks, uh, as Omicron has been spreading, they've essentially uh, done everything possible to disarm the population and prematurely declare uh, that the Omicron variant uh, is likely to be mild uh, and you know less uh, dangerous than than previous uh, var uh, variants of the virus. Uh, and they haven't gone as far as uh, officials in Australia and, and other countries uh, to uh, declare that it would be uh, beneficial for Omicron to uh, you know rip through society, sort of a you know variant of, of herd immunity. Um, but the uh, the policies, the, the statements that they've made uh, about this um, have had a real impact, and uh, I think you know the, the policies that they're implementing will you know have the same result. That's sort of a you know de facto uh, herd immunity uh, continuation of the the vaccine only approach, and I think you know it, it uh, the the um, virulence and you know lethality of Omicron or of any variant are uh, sort of lagging indicators, and it'll take time to determine that uh, scientifically. Uh, but the, uh, the surge in, in hospitalizations and the warnings um, that we've seen from, from uh, scientists on the ground in South Africa show that it's, you know, it's, it's likely to be, the severity is likely to be similar to, to that of uh, previous variants. Uh, and um, as this, this slide shows, really the, uh, the higher transmissibility of uh, Omicron uh, really you know, is, is sort of the, the most significant factor. Um, this is a, a tweet uh, from today by uh, Dr. Malgorzada Gasparovic, uh, who's a developmental biologist from Canada. Um, and hopefully everyone uh, on the, the meeting has seen the webinars that we've held, uh, but on August 22nd and October 24th, the WSWS hosted uh, webinars um, outlining the, the science of uh, how to eliminate COVID-19 and ultimately eradicate it worldwide. And uh, Dr. Gasparovic took part in, in both of those. And uh, this graph, she you know, sort of shows the um, sort of the, the impact of transmissibility. And she uh, tweeted along with it, uh, quote, a virus that spreads more rapidly, even if milder, could cause much more deaths. A hypothetical example of a 10 times less deadly virant, uh, variant uh, with an infection fatality rate of uh, 0.008% uh, with twice or two times higher effective transmissibility. Uh, so that's the, uh, the, green, uh, the green line. Um, in, in roughly 20 days, uh, that variant uh, will surpass the, uh, the number of 
uh, deaths from a uh, variant that spreads more slowly, uh, but is causes more severe infection. Um, and so I can I can go into that a bit more later, but I think, um, or if, if anyone has questions about it, but I think it's it's you know very significant, and it's uh, you know what we're seeing in South Africa, just this this uh, surge in hospitalizations. We haven't seen you know the the indicator of deaths will, or the the number of deaths will be a lagging uh, statistic, but um, it's you know just given the incredible volume of uh, infections and hospitalizations that. Uh, alone will cause a you know greater surge in death than if it were a less transmissible and um, more severe uh, variant and uh, I think the the data that's that was released this week is very significant there were multiple studies uh, indicating that are showing that omicron uh, will cause a dramatic reduction uh, in the ability of the Pfizer of the, the different uh, vaccines to uh, prevent infection uh, and essentially uh, the studies uh, show that for people that have received a, a third uh, dose of vaccine, what they call a booster, uh, it, they have roughly um, the same level of protection against Omicron as someone who uh, is uh, double vaccinated, uh, previously had against the wild type of the, the virus. Um, and so it's essentially a, a qualitative uh, shift in the efficacy of the vaccines. And if you are only uh, double vaccinated, if you've had two uh, doses, uh, then your level of protection against Omicron is, uh, you know, near near zero, um, and I think it's it's um, it's very significant. And again, this has also been uh, distorted and um, downplayed in the media, at least here here in the U.S. Uh, they've attempted to uh, solely present the basically frame it as as uh, you know a reason to go get your booster and sort of a you know the boosters are highly effective and you know will protect you uh, while you know essentially not stressing the uh, the real dangers posed to uh, well to everyone but in particular to people that have had uh, two doses um, here in the U.S. Uh, I think it's a little over 15 percent of all people have re re uh, received a booster um, but globally the figure is uh, only uh, just past four percent uh, and only 45% of the world population has had uh, two doses of vaccine. Uh, so I think just the um, the way in which Omicron uh, can can now you know really spread through society is uh, essentially you know placed us back at, at square one, uh, and it's uh, it's really you know an incredibly um, precarious uh, situation. I said earlier the uh, you know they're forecasting as many as a million uh, new infections per day. Uh, in the United Kingdom uh, by Christmas, uh, and it's uh, it's clear that Omicron will vastly intensify, you know, an already uh, catastrophic situation. Uh, here in the United States, the uh, Delta surge uh, is becoming increasingly dire uh, before Omicron has has taken hold. Uh, I believe today they reported that Omicron has been detected in 25 states, uh, but the uh, you know, just Delta is is really wreaking havoc. Um, there's you know now just under 120,000 uh, daily new cases. Over 60,000 people are hospitalized, uh, and over 15,000 are in intensive care units. Uh, and an average of just over 1,200 people are now dying in the U.S. from COVID every day. Uh, and this is expected to rise uh, dramatically in the coming weeks. Uh, this is a photo of an ICU nurse uh, here in, in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, which is now the epicenter of the of the pandemic in the in the United States. Uh, well, M Michigan more broadly, um, but Detroit is having a major. Um, it's you know part of the surge. Um, but essentially, since the the end of uh, July, uh, Delta has uh, been you know really really um, spreading uh, unchecked and, and you know ripping through uh, American society, um, and it's. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's bound up with this you know vaccine only approach uh, and really the um, the efforts to to normalize um, normalize the pandemic, normalize uh, mass death. Uh, that you know the the uh, speech by Rochelle Walensky on on May 13, encouraging people to take off their masks. Uh, there was never really there's never been any uh, concerted effort to educate the population on uh, any really any aspect of the pandemic. They've just said get your Get your vaccine and you'll be okay and that that's essentially how, what's continued today and that's you know one of the major reasons we're in such a catastrophe um 
but just to go into some of the statistics, Michigan now has uh, its highest seven day average of, of daily new cases uh, since the start of the pandemic, uh, roughly 8,000 hospitals are at capacity. Uh, you know, and there's the, fed, the federal government has had to send in uh, teams of, of doctors, nurses, and other healthcare workers to support hospitals. Uh, only 55% of Michigan residents are fully vaccinated, uh, and a small uh, fraction of that has received their booster shot, uh, meaning that millions of people are at risk of uh, severe disease, hospitalization, and, and death. Uh, and the number of patients in uh, hospitals here is now above uh, 4,600. Uh, which has broken the previous record set a year ago uh, before the vaccines were available. Uh, and at this point, the entire Northeast region in the US, uh, including uh, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, uh, is experiencing an exponential growth of new cases. Uh, and uh, in each of those states, uh, as well as others um, throughout the, the country, they've been forced to call in uh, the National Guard uh, to provide treatment at hospitals uh, just because of the severe uh, staffing shortage. There's been huge um, uh, levels of uh, early resignations by nurses, uh, elevated rates of PTSD, uh, trauma, uh, and it's, uh, it's just, it's really horrible. And, uh, in, in, uh, and so this is, um, you know, all of this is taking place, you know, before, before Omicron has become dominant in the U.S., uh, which is expected to really, you know, uh, take place over, over the coming weeks. Um, and I think, you know, just the response, uh, you know, as, as you've seen in Australia, the, uh, the response here in the US by uh, the, you know, entire political establishment, uh, by the corporate media and the unions uh, has just been um, just complete uh, negligence and indifference uh, to the, uh, this deepening catastrophe. Uh, and they've, you know, the, their only policy is uh, to promote vaccines and to insist that all schools and uh, workplaces stay open. Uh, and, you know, in particular, um, to uh, prevent uh, any um, disruption of the, the markets and in particular the uh, Christmas holiday uh, shopping season, uh, which is, you know, a major, major um, source of revenue for all the major corporations in the, in the US. And, uh, the situation in schools uh, has actually become particularly dire. Uh, that's been, um, that's also the sort of the central policy. When uh, Biden spoke last week, he, uh, uh, you know, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. Actually, I don't want to jump ahead. But um, basically, this this uh, this entire fall semester uh, has just seen a sustained mass infection of children, uh, and wherever uh, outbreaks are tracked, schools are almost always the number one source of outbreaks here in Michigan. They keep fairly close uh, track of that, and uh, basically, you know, since the um, the surge of the uh, alpha variant last spring, uh, schools have been the number one uh, source of outbreaks, uh, and in usually the absolute majority of, of outbreaks uh, across the state take place in K through 12 schools. Uh, and the the uh, there's an organization called the American Academy of Pediatrics, which uh, compiles the uh, number of infections among children, uh, as well as hospitalizations and, and deaths. And for 17 straight weeks, uh, there have been over 100,000 official infections uh, among children. And you know the real numbers are, are much higher. The uh, CDC itself estimates that roughly a third of all uh, children under 18, uh, or 20, 26 million children, have likely been infected with COVID in the US. And uh, they also... Um, have documented that nearly a thousand children under 18 uh, have died from COVID in the U.S. Uh, and I just wanted to stress this: this is an important picture. Um, there is enormous opposition uh, within the working class uh, among the youth uh, to these policies of, of mass death. Uh, and you know, it's uh, it's really um, I think we're we're reaching a, a tipping point. Uh, and this is a photo uh, which shows uh, students at Martin Luther King High School in Detroit. Uh, who organized a sick out uh, leading their teachers in a, it was brief, it was only 20 minutes, uh, but it was on uh, November 17th, uh, the week before Thanksgiving. Uh, and they uh, essentially this uh, action uh, forced the, uh, the district uh, here in uh, Detroit to close schools for the entire um, uh, week. And they had been intending to, to keep them open until 
uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, but you know, knowing that there was this uh, growing opposition, a sentiment for for struggle by young people, by educators, uh, they were forced to do that, and they've been forced to uh, uh, have no classes on Fridays. And uh, you know, and it's essentially to sort of promote hygiene theater to say that they're doing deep cleaning on uh, in the the classrooms, uh, which, as we all know, does nothing because COVID is airborne. Uh, but they're uh, under enormous uh, pressure to um, to sort of carry out these these uh, measures uh, because this, you know, if if there were to be you know mass um, walkouts in Detroit. Uh, you know that would quickly spread to to Chicago to every every major city. Um, there is also uh, here there, there's actually actually really horrible. Um, the entire situation is just really catastrophic in in Michigan right now. There was the um, the school shooting at at Oxford High School uh, last week, which is at a, a really um, really unsettled the entire uh, population, the entire community um, there, but throughout Michigan and and in other other parts of the country and. Uh, there's been um, hundreds of schools and uh, districts uh, that have had to uh, close uh, ever ever since that shooting um, because of copycat threats uh, and uh, there's a significant um, wild wildcat action that was taken by uh, teachers uh, at a school uh, the school at Marygrove uh, and I believe four out of five days this week they organized um, sick outs uh, independently of the the uh, Detroit Federation of Teachers, which is, you know, totally corrupt and, uh, you know, allied with the Democratic Party, uh, and they, uh, um, anyway, they, they uh, have, uh, you know, refused um, uh, to to go into their classrooms. They, they, they don't. Their classrooms don't have uh, locks on their doors. They have bars on their windows. So if there were to be a, a school shooter, you know, they would be, you know, totally um, at risk. And you know, this combined with you know, mass infections uh, from COVID. Uh, it's just the, the situation is sort of, you know, becoming uh, completely uh, untenable uh, in, in schools and in workplaces uh, in, in Michigan and across the US. And uh, in response, you know, to this opposition, the um, they Biden un unveiled this uh, test to stay program uh, designed to keep kids at school, uh, which is the same as you have in, that they're promoting in, in Australia, where if a kid tests, uh, negative, then they can stay learning in person if one of their peers tested positive. Uh, so it's just, you know, totally unscientific measure to keep the schools open. And uh, this policy was immediately endorsed by Randy Weingarten, uh, shown here, who's the uh, president of the second largest teachers union, the American Federation of Teachers. Uh, and their position, you know, I think it's important to stress that their the position of the unions and the Democrats, uh, you know, increasingly resembles that of the, the herd immunity advocates of the far right. Um, in September, Weingarten chaired a meeting at which she uh, invited the one of the co-authors of the Great Barrington Declaration to to speak, uh, and we wrote on it today on the WSWS. But there was a, sort of an attempt to recover her her image, uh, where she was going to hold a meeting with uh, scientists that are promoted mitigations in schools. Uh, but she, because of the relations that she's uh, formed uh, with these far right forces, far right parents groups, uh, and you know, herd immunity advocates. Uh, she came under pressure from them and immediately adapted to it, and the event had to be uh, canceled. Um, and so I think you know, it's it's a, uh, you know, it's it's really a sort of explosive uh, situation uh, here uh, right now, just given the um, sort of tremendous level of uh, opposition that's developing with uh, every official institution uh, implicated in, uh, in the crimes of the, the pandemic. And I think, you know, the pandemic has had really a profound impact on American and, and world society. Uh, and it's really, um, you know, it scarred an entire generation of young people. Uh, there was a study here uh, published Tuesday, which found that rates of depression and anxiety uh, have doubled among children under 18 years old. Uh, with one in four young people now experiencing depression and one in five experiencing anxiety. Uh, and, you know, the report noted that, um, you know, many, uh, many of uh, these young people have themselves uh, caught COVID, uh, maybe suffering from, from long COVID symptoms, or they've lost a loved one uh, to the disease. Uh, and there was a separate study that was done in 
June 2021, uh, this, this year, this summer, uh, which found that 140,000 children in the US had lost a parent or grandparent care, caregiver to, to COVID-19. Uh, and I think just the, the policies uh, that have been pursued throughout the pandemic uh, really amount to a series of, of monumental crimes. Uh, and in the US, there's just been you know, really a, a direct continuity between the pandemic policies of, of Trump and Biden uh, you know, with Biden advancing nothing but vaccinations, uh, despite this, you know, proving totally bankrupt. Um, so I know I'm getting to it kind of late, but uh, I think, you know, one of the, the really the central purpose of uh, the, in, the inquest, the global workers inquest into the COVID-19 pandemic uh, is to really comprehensively expose uh, all of the crimes that have been committed uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, and I think it'll be a very, you know, significant undertaking um, you know, throughout throughout the world, uh, and I just uh, hopefully people have, have seen it uh, on the call. But you know, I think uh, you know we've gotten off to a strong start uh, with the inquest. Uh, we had an engineer with uh, or an interview with the engineer and mask expert uh, Nicholas Smith, who gave wide ranging testimony on uh, all things related to masks, uh, masking policies in the United States. Uh, he made clear that the uh, the types of masks that have been promoted by the politicians are not safe uh, and cannot you know, prevent airborne transmission uh, of COVID-19. Uh, and he also reviewed the, uh, the warnings that were made before the pandemic on the need to stockpile high quality masks, uh, all of which were ignored. Uh, and then I, I think the really most powerful part of his uh, presentation is the month by month review of the policy, the major policy decisions uh, surrounding masks, uh, which have been made since uh, January 2020 to the present, um, and I think it would be important to you know prepare a similar similar report for Australia for uh, every country really. They've they've uh, there's been no effort to educate the, uh, the public on these issues. I know uh, in one of uh, Smith's uh, tweets, uh, someone from New Zealand commented that uh, it was the same thing there that they you know there's no effort to to educate people on airborne transmission or stress the need for the, the using the highest quality masks. Uh, and I think also, you know, just similar, the major um, or one of the major aspects of the the inquest will be to prepare um, prepare reports, uh, testimony on every major aspect uh, of the pandemic in each country, uh, including the uh, the topics of what was known before the pandemic, uh, what was done in the the critical first three months from January to March 2020, uh, the issue of the the Wuhan lab conspiracy theory. Uh, the impact of COVID-19 on, on children and the role that schools play in, in viral transmission, uh, as well as the, uh, the role played by uh, capitalist politicians, the, the unions and the, the corporate media uh, in facilitating uh, you know, the, the policies that have been pursued. Um, but I think really the most critical aspect of the inquest uh, is that it will involve workers in every industry uh, bringing forward their experiences uh, during the pandemic uh, here in the United States uh, we're beginning to uh, prepare interviews, uh, video interviews with, with healthcare workers, auto workers, uh, educators, Amazon workers, and other sections of the working class, uh, telling their stories, uh, explaining how the pandemic has, has impacted them uh, and who they hold responsible for, for these crimes. Uh, and I think that has to be really the central uh, orientation of the inquest in Australia and really fighting to um, to bring forward the, the experiences uh, of workers uh, during the past two years and uh, in the present. Uh, and I think really, you know, in developing the inquest, uh, the aim is to, to educate the working class and politically arm uh, workers with an understanding of what has taken place and why and who is responsible. Uh, and I think we have to see this not as a scholastic exercise, but really intimately connected to the present day fight for the global elimination and eradication of COVID-19, uh, which is the only way we can stop uh, new and, and more dangerous variants from evolving. Uh, so just in conclusion, I'd urge everyone uh, here at the meeting to support the inquest, uh, carefully read the initial statement uh, if you haven't already, uh, and prepare to give testimony on your experiences at schools uh, and other, other workplaces across Australia. Uh, and above all, uh, we must use the, the inquest to, to deepen the fight to eliminate COVID-19 globally in order to protect children and all of society from uh, further needless infections and deaths. So thank you. Thanks very much, Evan, for that uh, wide ranging report. Uh, we're now gonna open up for questions, not just on the issue of uh, the 
global workers inquest as important as that is but on any aspect of the report that was just given um, including the situation with the emergence of the omicron variant uh, the uh, spread of the well the delta crisis which is preceding that across the united states and other countries um i i have two questions for you sort of like i I've, I've been uh uh, reflecting on Omicron, it sounds like there's, it's vaccine uh, untouchable, you know, un undestroyable. So I'm thinking that our scientists and the people in the United Front of, 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 of medical, you know, medical nurses and, uh, you know, scientists, uh, medical uh, people um, that are really amazing. Um, you know, that's like maybe one part of the United Front, but uh, the rest of us are, are the other part. But uh, to find, to uh, consider, I'm, I'm considering getting an, an, a pneumonia shot. If I could just uh, respond initially. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm done, thank you. Okay, um, well, I, I would just, uh, I, you know, a pneumonia shot is, is not going to uh, protect against uh, against COVID. So I would, um, you know, well, I'd, uh, what I, what I would say, you know, is just, uh, it's, uh, you know, it is, it is, um, it is incredibly dangerous. You know, as you said, it's, uh, I, I wouldn't characterize it as sort of vaccine untouchable. Um, but it, like I was saying in the report, it, it sort of had, it has had a, a qualitative impact uh, in terms of, you know, essentially bringing us back an entire dose. Um, and so I think, you know, that, you know, I'm not sure exactly what the availability of boosters is uh, in Australia, but once those are available, uh, everyone on the call should get those. Uh, you know, you should take uh, measures to protect yourself at your workplace. Uh, wear the highest quality uh, masks that you can that you can get. We you know the interview with Smith goes into it in more detail, but elastomeric respirators provide a high degree of protection. Uh, in particular, um, P100 masks. Uh, they look a bit funny, but these actually protect, you know, filter out uh, something like 99.9997% uh, uh, of uh, particles at 0.3 microns and then 100% of particles at other uh, sizes. So they do offer a high level of um, protection at your workplace and are actually much more comfortable than like N95 masks. Uh, but I think just on the question of vaccines, you know, the, the, um, the technology is being developed they you know they likely won't have a uh, omicron specific vaccine ready until you know april at the earliest i would say march or april is what they're predicting um and so what i think what we have to fight for you know between now and then is for for lockdowns and i think that's going to become increasingly uh popular you know throughout the world as as uh, omicron rapidly spreads and just has devastating impacts because they 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 know how to develop these vaccines they know how to protect people um and so they you know they have to you know what we have to fight for is, is taking the the measures to to you know stop transmission in the here and now while those vaccines are developed uh, and that's you know that's what we've advocated from the start of the the pandemic is that you know first cases well you know during the initial months cases have to be uh, brought to zero. Uh, but once the vaccines were developed, we said, you know, we have to impose lockdowns until everyone's vaccinated and it's, you know, safe to, you know, resume activities. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, that, I guess that would be an initial um, response. But, it, you know, it is, it is really uh, catastrophic, the, the, the impact that it's had on the efficacy. And I think it's a warning, you know, if, if it, if they allow the spread to continue, then they'll, they will, you know, a, a variant could evolve that is, you know, vaccine untouchable or uh, completely um, evades the uh, the vaccines and basically puts us back at, at square one. And that hasn't quite happened yet. You know, if you if you've had a booster um, there, then you're you're you know, you're you can still have a breakthrough infection. You can, um, you know, you can become hospitalized, uh, but you know, you you do have a much much higher level of uh, protection. Thank you, Evan. We're getting a few questions in via the chat box. Thank you for those people who've uh, typed that in. There are three questions that are pretty closely connected, Evan, due to the, uh, sorry, regarding the impact on children. Will asks, is there any more information on the numbers and impact of long COVID on US children? A huge number infected tragedy. Uh, we have a question from Frank. Can Evan discuss how the schools are the center of the pandemic? 
and the impact on children and teachers in more detail. And I guess connected to those two is a question from Zach, what indications do we currently have for how deadly Omicron is in comparison to Delta? Yeah, yeah, I think those are all very important questions. Um, just on the first one, uh, I honestly, it's something that is um, very much covered up in the United States, uh, but they, a lot of the, the best data uh, comes out of the, uh, the UK. They actually have more um, sort of resources allocated to, to tracking long COVID. Uh, and, you know, the, it's, it's complicated, the, but the, you know, the general, um, you know, from what I've seen, the, the sort of the most um, sort of likely percentage of children that, that uh, suffer from long COVID is, uh, it's, comp you know, it's fairly comparable to, a, to adults. Uh, I, what, what we've reported in the past is roughly, you know, 15% of children are believed to suffer from, from uh, long COVID. But I think, you know, it's something that is um, sort of still developing. I saw a report uh, just the other day um, that they estimate that uh, up to 50% of all people could be suffering from long COVID. Um, so it's, uh, I think it's something that is um, poorly understood and, you know, not, um, or sorry, I shouldn't say, but it's, it's something that uh, scientists are still uh, studying. And we actually, we, at the October 24th webinar, we had a uh, one of the reports was by uh, Deep D. Gurdasani, who uh, writes on this. She, she's actually done a number of threads in the, the past on, on Twitter on uh, the impacts of long COVID. Um, but on, just on the, uh, so I, I think it's something we have to, to study further, but it is, um, it is quite devastating. You know, the, there's studies indicating that, uh, you know, depending on the severity of your case, you can lose, you know, mul multiple um, IQ points, uh, on, you know, uh, Sort of, it can have an impact on your your cognitive abilities, uh, and you know I think the issue of uh, brain fog is um, you know is very terrifying. And we we did an interview with uh, a T cell immunologist uh, named Anthony Leonardi, where he went into um, a lot of this and sort of the the uh, potential long term dangers of um, of long COVID. But one of the things that he's most concerned about is. Uh, studies, uh, there's a study done in, uh, in uh, rhesus macaques, uh, which are sort of uh, the impact, impacts of viruses on them can usually be comparable to what the experience would be in a human. And uh, they found, you know, uh, signs of uh, Lewy bodies, or they, they saw Lewy bodies formed in, uh, in, every, um, in every macaque that was uh, part of this uh, survey that of, uh, or as part of this study of uh, the effects of long COVID on on them, um, so I think that that was really alarming. Uh, and uh, as far as I know, there haven't well, there have there have been some um, sort of uh, it's not it's not my area of expertise, but they they do uh, there have been studies on the uh, sort of brain scans on uh, on people that have long COVID, and they've you know shown um, you know declines in as I said declines in IQ points, but also uh, sort of damage to uh, you know gray matter. On uh, you know different different parts of your your brain, um, and the, I think in particular the uh, the hippocampus, um, and which is they believe that the the loss of uh, the sense of taste and smell is connected to the loss of uh, part of your uh, your brain tissue in those in those areas. Um, so it's incredibly alarming, and uh, I think really underscores you know the need again, to really fight for, um, for elimination and eradication, because this, you know, as all of the, the scientists that we've spoken with and um, many in Australia, you know, have emphasized, this isn't something that we can just live with, uh, you know, long-term. Um, and just on the, the question on schools, uh, there's been a number of studies that have shown uh, that, you know, the, that schools are a major source of transmission. Um, and uh, let me just look. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I don't know, I, we, we've written actually a number of, our, Benjamin Mateus has written a number of articles on that on, on the WSWS that I could, I could send links to, but um, early on, uh, there, last summer, in the summer of 2020, there were uh, studies that found the, that the number one uh, non-pharmaceutical intervention that prevented tens of thousands of, of deaths in the, in the US and globally was the closure of schools, uh, and that when you know, combined with, with uh, other NPIs, um, you know, that that, that would uh, sort of have the most significant impact on, uh, you know, reducing deaths, reducing infections. 
Um, and I think it's, it's very, um, every teacher knows uh, that schools are uh, centers for viral transmission, that uh, ventilation is often very poor, uh, filtration in rooms, uh, and, you know, they, that um, one of the interesting things that I think a lot more people have become aware of during the pandemic is the, uh, the issue of uh, CO2 buildup uh, in classrooms. Uh, and the, uh, a lot of, many people use a CO2 monitor. You can use a CO2 monitor as a, a proxy for um, sort of, you know, how much, uh, sort of co how many COVID aerosols would be uh, present uh, because as CO CO2 builds up, it, it means that, you know, there's not enough ventilation, you're not getting fresh air. Uh, and so, you know, the same would be, it would be the same for, um, for COVID. Uh, and, you know, there's been many studies conducted on the, you know, lower, uh, lowered cognitive uh, performance uh, with, you know, high concentrations of CO2. Um, but in, so anyways, uh, the, you know, there's um, a, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of intuitive that schools would be centers for transmission. There have been studies that show that there was another one in uh, Montreal, uh, which showed that, uh, infections among children preceded uh, from from schools preceded uh, surges among uh, their parents you know, in, in their middle ages. Um, there was one other question. Um, trying to, oh, the, uh, what indications do we have for how deadly Omicron is in comparison to Delta? Um, I would just say it, it's a it's a lagging indicator. So we we don't really know yet. Um, it, that, that we won't know that for uh, really at, at least three to four more weeks, likely longer. Um, what I've read recently is, you know, it usually takes uh, five weeks uh, for five weeks on average for someone to die from COVID uh, once they've from from inf their infection to uh, death. That's sort of the average amount of time. So I think in the next few weeks we'll we'll have a an accurate uh, picture of that and you know more more data on it. Um, so we can't really compare it at, at this point. Um, so I guess that, that would be my answer there. But then, it, you know, it's that um, the fact that there haven't been deaths, uh, you know, and that there, there have been some initial um, reports that lo a lower percentage of uh, patients hospitalized in South Africa have required uh, ventilation or have been admitted into ICU, uh, that some, that that means that this that Omicron is mild uh, and is sort of nothing to worry about. Um, but I, as I outlined in the report, the issue of uh, higher transmissibility, um, if you do, you know, sort of using the the models that uh, Gasparovich, Dr. Gasparovich um, has done and, you know, just sort of basic math, if you have higher transmissibility for a less deadly variant than if, you know, you have a major surge in cases, uh, then so numerically more people will die from that variant. Um, so it's a lower percentage of people, but the actual, the absolute number would be higher and quicker uh, because it, it would spread uh, much more rapidly, which is what we're seeing uh, in South Africa and in the UK and uh, Denmark and, and other countries. Thank you, Evan. Uh, I'm mindful of the time, but I'm hoping that we're gonna be able to cover three more questions. There's one final question. Well, there's one question I'll put to you at the end about the workers in quest, but there were two other connected questions. One from Carolyn, she raises, you talked about the action by students in Michigan. Can you talk about the role that teachers and parents are playing in opposing face-to-face -face learning, in particular in relation to the student seek outs in Michigan? And Sue asks, could you please speak about the role of the educator rank and file committees, especially, in, especially now in Michigan? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, well, just on the first question from Carolyn, uh, yeah, the, that action was primarily driven by the students, but there was, um, you know, there was a lot of uh, support for the teachers. It was sort, it was from what we could tell, it was it was largely spontaneous. Uh, we, um, you know, we didn't uh, sort of we don't have any um, members of our Michigan uh, rank and file committee at that school. Um, but we do have, have uh, teachers in, in the, the Detroit uh, Public Schools District. Uh, and, you know, from what we heard, there was a lot of opposition, um, in particular to that, the principal of that school, uh, not just for COVID, but also sort of for, um, you know, punitive measures that, that he would take against students. Um, and so, you know, opposition had, you know, been sort of brewing for a while. Um, and it was, you know, but then it, it was it was very intimately connected to to COVID, and they actually had a uh, 
petition uh, in which they explicitly referenced that and you know said that the, the schools were not safe. Um, so they're you know they're the uh, it's it's been you know this whole fall semester has just been um, you know really really terrible and you just if you look at the the number of cases in Michigan it's just been steadily rising uh, ever ever since the schools reopened uh, in um, it well it began in, in July uh, when they sort of lifted all restrictions in the state uh, but then once the schools opened in late August it was just a sort of a, a steady um, steady increase in, in new cases and uh, as I said it's you know it's been the number one uh, source of outbreaks uh, and people people know that people it's it's sort of um, you know commonly uh, or it's it's becoming more more widely understood um, so yeah so there, there that action was primarily led by the students uh, it had a lot of support from the teachers at the school uh, and uh, I'm not I can't answer so much the the role that parents played but I, I imagine the parents supported it uh, in general the you know the parents are uh, supportive of, of such actions by students um, and then the other question on the role of the educators rank and file committees uh, well we last week actually we had a meeting of the the Michigan rank and file committee and it was actually the um, sort of the best attended meeting that we've we've had in a, at least um, well I'd say I'd say a year since the the last surge uh, that we had in in uh, November 2020 um, it had been you know, it's been a bit of a, a struggle to develop the committee. Um, you know, we, there's a number of uh, members that are very, um, you know, very committed and, you know, very, uh, very active, uh, you know, very active on, on social media. There's a few uh, Facebook groups in Michigan uh, for teachers. Um, but yeah, I'd say, I'd say the committee has, has really, you know, developed in recent weeks. We've been, you know, throughout the fall, we've been uh, publishing articles on the situation with schools and, and writing statements, um, but we really, you know, came out in, in support of the the demonstration. Um, I think the the uh, response from the district uh, did have an impact. You know, the fact that they closed, they were forced to close schools for all of uh, the entire week of Thanksgiving. Um, you know, it sort of did. It, it became a bit more difficult to, you know, everyone everyone just wanted the week off and you know to be able to spend time with family. Um, so it was a bit. There was a bit less activity on, on social media, uh, but you know, right, right when we got back uh, last week, um, there was an uptick. Uh, but then there was the the shooting at Oxford. Um, I believe it was the Tuesday after after uh, classes resumed um, last week, and you know that, like I said, that's that's had a major impact. It really shocked um, the entire. Uh, the entire state in particular, but, you know, throughout, throughout the country, it was, it's been national news um, for, you know, ever since it happened and, uh, and inter international news. And uh, so, you know, it's, um, it's just, it's like I was saying, it's, it's really um, uh, just a really horrific situation in the, the schools here right now. You know, if you're not, uh, if you don't get infected or, you know, if, if you're, um, you know, you're you're just you're at risk of infection, at risk of uh, death from from COVID, uh, and now you know the risk of death from uh, a, you know violent uh, school shooting or some other act of act of violence. Um, so it's it's really you know the entire society in the U.S. I think is really in a state of of deep crisis, uh, and you know it's it's sort of it feel it, there's a sense that things are just crum crumbling, that you know the healthcare system is collapsing. Uh, the, the education system is collapsing. There, I didn't mention it, but in September, there were 30,000 educators left the profession uh, in one month alone. Uh, and that, you know, that continued in October and uh, November. Uh, they haven't released the, the figures, but there's just been massive attrition in schools across the country. Um, so it's really, uh, you know, I, I think a very explosive situation and, you know, the working class, and this is under conditions in which the billionaires in the U.S. have amassed over $2 trillion, $2.1 trillion uh, through August uh, 2021, uh, you know, since the start of the pandemic, uh, while, you know, millions are, have been thrown into, into poverty uh, or, you know, suffer from long COVID. There was an article yesterday which estimated that um, you know, as many as five, five million or more 
uh, workers could be suffering from long COVID right now. And that, that, that is one of the major reasons there's a, a labor shortage uh, in the US. Uh, there's also the issue of inflation. Uh, just um, in the inflation figures in November uh, were the highest, I believe, since 1982. Uh, so, you know, 40 years. Uh, and it's, you know, it's been like that month after month after month. Um, so it's sort of, it's, it's really tense and it feels, you know, like we're at a, at a breaking point. And I think the increase in attendance um, at the meeting last week was, was very significant. It was, you know, an important discussion. There were, you know, parents from um, the, the same county where the, the school shooting uh, took place at, at Oxford, uh, parents and uh, educators from Detroit, uh, from Ann Arbor, from other parts of the state. Um, and there was a lot of interest in, you know, the, the perspective that we outlined, uh, you know, of organizing independently of the unions, of the, the Democratic Party, and, and really, you know, fighting to build a mass movement to, to stop the pandemic. Um, and, you know, it's it, the same um, sort of tense. And, you know, there, there's a surge in infections in the, the auto plants right now as well. And we're really fighting to connect the, the uh, educators with auto workers, with Amazon healthcare workers, and, you know, develop, you know, mass movement across industries uh, and, you know, inter internationally uh, to, to stop this, you know, this madness and, uh, you know, protect lives. Um, so we, you know, it's, it's, I think it's really developing uh, quickly right now. Uh, and there's a lot of, a lot of potential, um, but, you know, just it's, and so, yeah, so I guess I, I would, conclude with that, that we were, we we're making developments and it's the same across the US, the committees on the, the West Coast are, we're seeing sort of an increase in attendance um, in many parts of the country in the South. Uh, we're having joint meetings of the, the uh, Tennessee and Texas rank and file committees, uh, people from the Alabama committee that was established last year are, are uh, had sort of dropped out of touch, but now they're in contact again. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's, uh, it's really, it's been quite powerful. Uh, and, you know, we've been reporting on, you know, developments in Australia with the, the CPFE, or sorry, CFPE, and uh, really the, um, the need to, to connect the, the struggles in the US with those internationally. We've also, you know, participated in the meetings in Canada and in Germany. Uh, and we've had participants from, uh, from Brazil, uh, uh, Sue from, from your committee. And uh, yeah, so I, I think it's, it's really, you know, developing uh, powerfully, but we have to really, um, you know, uh, pick up the pace and then, you know, keep pace with uh, the uh, keep pace with the pandemic and really fight to, um, you know, develop uh, these committees as widely as possible, reach new layers, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, fight to establish deeper connections in the in the working class uh, and really, you know, build build a powerful movement to, to save lives. Thanks very much, Evan. I know you need to go, but if it was possible for you to briefly just speak on one of one more question, which was, could you elaborate more on the form the workers' inquest will take? Uh, yeah. Well, I, I guess I would say that that is uh, still being determined. I think we've, um, I think the, you know, yeah, we we still we're we're still, you know, there will be many more um, discussions uh, about that precisely. But I think, uh, you know, we we plan to. Uh, really, you know, compile uh, in each country, uh, compile, you know, a wealth of uh, testimony and really uh, document, um, you know, what, what's taken place, uh, as I said, with, with all of the, the major aspects of the, the pandemic um, and really, you know, try to present it in, a, in an accessible manner. I think one of, the, one of the things we've been discussing is really developing uh, timelines uh, for you know, for, for, you know, for every aspect. And I thought that was one of, you know, as I said, one of the powerful points of uh, Nicholas Smith's interview was the sort of month by month breakdown. Um, but it's, you know, it's a complex um, process. And I, you know, I, I guess I would say that the uh, Omicron, the, the uh, emergence of Omicron has um, to an extent, um, I, I don't know if disrupted is the right word, but it's sort of uh, stalled the, uh, Sort of implementation of of those of a uh, sort of the um, the presentation of the the inquest, but you know I think um, the yeah you know, so there's the interview with Smith. We're preparing uh, more interviews with scientists, uh, and then um, yeah I, I I think the video testimonies uh, are are going to be very central. Uh, you know we live in you know the 
uh, the 21st century where you know there's uh, millions of uh, billions of people on social media and you know videos are a very um, accessible way to uh, you know to share experiences so we're really you know trying to develop that aspect of it I think that's been a uh, you know powerful part of the uh, campaign against the electoral laws in, in Australia is the the volume of uh, videos that have been produced um, so that that's one aspect uh, but then um, yeah, I don't, it's, I guess I would just say it's, it's something, it's, it's a work in progress. It is going to be, you know, a month's long, uh, investigation, uh, and it'll take really, you know, the effort of, um, you know, everyone that writes for the, the WSWS, the SCP members, uh, and, and every member of the, the rank and file committees, you know, to really bring forward, uh, your experiences, uh, and to, um, to make the, the findings known uh, within the working class. And I think that's sort of the most critical aspect of it is to, um, to develop this you know, political uh, and um, you know, so historical understanding uh, within far broader layers uh, of, of the working class that really the only way we can put an end to this pandemic is through, um, you know, through, through educating, educating the working class and that, that that's the central, um, you know, social class uh, whose interests are bound up with, you know, putting an end to the pandemic. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're the ones, you know, or the, the working class has, has been, um, you know, just, just sacrificed uh, en masse uh, throughout this pandemic. And we have to, we have to fight to really, um, you know, develop a, a powerful mass uh, international movement to, to end it. And I think um, sort of the, I think the, the way in which the, in the, um, you know, the, the pandemic is an ongoing crime, I think is, is important and really, uh, so, you know, if, if people, I think, I think just sort of documenting, um, you know, we, we, we want to bring forward uh, sort of in, you know, minute detail, sort of what's, what's happened in each industry uh, and, you know, really, as I said, present a timeline and present, uh, you know, the major turning points and the major actors, you know, if you look at schools in the US, uh, you know what? What's been the role by played by Randy Weingarten, uh, by Rochelle Walensky, uh, you know, just and then you know Biden, uh, Jesse Sharkey. Um, you know, there's there's a whole uh, there's a number of uh, really critical um, players who are are uh, culpable uh, in these these crimes, which have you know just devastated uh, you know devastated society. So. I don't know. I hope that, that helps as an initial answer. Um, but I guess I would just say it is going to be a very um, extended uh, process. Uh, and, you know, we have to sort of think creatively about the way in which it's uh, presented on, on the website, presented on social media, uh, and really make it uh, as widely known as, as possible. Thank you so much, Evan, for your time and for your report. Uh, that was a really important uh, contribution, uh, very much appreciated by everyone involved. International collaboration is obviously a central aspect of the work of the Committee for Public Education, as it is for our rank and file committees around the world. Um, and so your presentation was you know, very much appreciated as a contribution to this meeting. Uh, so with that, we'll say thank you and uh, let you go. Have a good evening. All right. Thank, thank you so much for, for having me. OK, thanks again, Evan. Now, we do have a resolution that we are going to move um, through this meeting in support of the global inquest. This meeting of the Committee for Public Education fully endorses the WSWS initiative to hold a global workers inquest into the COVID-19 pandemic. We resolve to support this initiative in any way possible and to encourage teachers, parents and students to participate as fully as possible. As governments around the world have embraced a let it rip approach to the pandemic, we have to use the inquest as an opportunity to educate the only force capable of undertaking a struggle for an eradication program to the pandemic, the working class. So that's the resolution that we're proposing to adopt in support of the Global Workers' Inquest. Uh, we have a pretty busy agenda, so I'm, unless there's any super important questions on that inquest, I would propose to put that to the vote straight away. Does anybody have any objections to that? Okay, I'm gonna put that to the vote. Can you please use the chat box to indicate your vote, just you can type in a aye or a yes if you support that resolution. If anybody wishes to abstain or vote against, you can indicate that as well.
but that is clearly carried and appears to be unanimous. So thank you very much to all meeting participants for your support for that resolution. Uh, that resolution will be publicized you know, via the CFPE's social media accounts and via the World Social's website. Um, so it is an important contribution there. So thank you very much for that. We will move to the next item on the agenda, which is to take a report uh, on the situation in New South Wales. Last Tuesday, uh, approximately 50,000 teachers and school workers went on strike in New South Wales, Australia's largest and most popular state. Uh, that marked the first uh, statewide strike in more than a decade. So a very important development. Here to speak on that and the political implications and significance of that uh, development is Zach Hambides. Uh, Zach is a uh, regular writer for the World Socialist website. He's a member of the Socialist Equality Party's National Committee. And he's also a member, sorry, excuse me, he's also the branch secretary of the SEP's uh, Sydney branch. So very warm welcome to you, Zach. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. And I know Evan, uh, Evan has left, but uh, I would also like to state my thanks for the presentation and the uh, answers that he gave. I think it is really very important um, that this information is distributed as widely as possible and that we fight uh, as our resolution that we've just adopted says uh, for the promotion of the inquest as broadly as we can in the working class and among educators. Um, as Patrick indicated uh, last to Tuesday, just a few days ago, uh, 50,000, approximately 50,000 New South Wales public school teachers went on strike. This was the first strike in 10 years. Um, it is part of a broader upsurge of the working class uh, that has taken place as social tensions have increased on an international level with the immense growth of social inequality as a direct result of the deliberate policies of governments backed by the unions. The New South Wales Teachers Federation was forced to call this strike for fear of enormous opposition among teachers if they did not do so. In fact, so determined were teachers to take strike action, they, in doing so, defied a ruling by the Industrial Relations Commission uh, demanding that the strike be called off. Now in Sydney, approximately 5,000 teachers rallied from schools across the Sydney region and, in some surrounding, and from some surrounding towns. Members of the CFPE attended the rally. We got interviews with teachers and distributed our statement, striking New South Wales teachers must fight for school shutdown to stop the spread of Omicron in Australia. In the statement, we said that the fight to defend teachers' conditions must be centered on protecting teachers and students from the most urgent threat that they currently face, that is illness and death from the COVID-19 pandemic. The New South Wales Teachers Federation, the Australian Education Union and the Independent Education Union have all collaborated with governments to force teachers back into schools. Uh, schools are repeating the lie that vaccines and minimal mitigation measures will keep teachers and students safe. Uh, this is very similar to the positions that have been put forward by teachers in the United States as Comrade Evan, Evan went through. We say in our statement, quote, this was the spread of the uh, ending of even, uh, sorry, this was the spearhead rather, of the ending of even limited lockdowns, the lifting of all safety restrictions and a ruling class campaign to force the population to live with the virus. In its homicidal program, dictated by corporate profit interests, the school must be fully open so that parents can be forced back to their workplaces, end quote. As a result, over 500 New South Wales public schools have had COVID cases, according to New South Wales Teachers Federation President, Angela Gabrielatos, who has subsequently refused to provide any information to teachers, including the names of the affected schools. Now in our statement, we call for the establishment of rank and file committees, which are needed to break the censorship of the unions, to share information on the spread of COVID in schools and unify the struggles of teachers in New South Wales with teachers in the rest of the country and indeed internationally. We insist there is no safe way to operate schools during widespread community transmission of COVID. These must be shut as part of broader measures to eliminate COVID and place workers above the profit interests, workers' lives, that is, above the profit interests of the billionaires. When we spoke to teachers on Tuesday, everyone told us a variation of essentially the same story. Teachers are increasingly unable to perform their job 
due to chronic understaffing, causing increased stress for those left behind and therefore further resignations only exacerbating the problem. This was true regardless of whether teachers were from large, recently amalgamated schools, small selective schools, uh, had just started teaching, or had indeed decades of experience. For example, Phil, a retired primary school teacher and principal with 44 years experience, said, quote, the vacancies are incredible. It is right through the whole state. We cannot get teachers to come in and commit because they can go somewhere else and get better pay, better conditions, where they don't have those 55 hours plus a week that we have to do, meaning teachers. This is having a devastating effect on teachers. One told us they have no free periods now because they must constantly cover vacancies, but even then, many classes continue to go unsupervised. This means that teachers have no time to plan, no time to reflect, and importantly, no time to collaborate with other teachers over their education work. An engineering teacher told us that she was, quote, feeling uh, falling apart trying to keep up, with many teachers echoing similar sentiments of just exhaustion. There is also huge administrative workloads for teachers. For example, one newly graduated casual teacher said he's now spending more time doing paperwork and lesson plans than actual teaching children, which is what he became a teacher to do in the first place, giving an indication of why there's such a high dropout rate. Some teachers expressed real concerns over COVID, but it was only the CFPE that raised the pandemic at the rally at all. Michael, a mathematics and physical education teacher, said it was incredibly irresponsible to send children and teachers into an unsafe environment and that with the spread of Omicron, the response of the government is to get people back into work and kids back to school for child minding. We can't properly teach, so what's the rush? Safety has to come first. People have had enough. That's why I'm here at the strike. And this was repeated by many others who spoke to us these sentiments at the rally. In contrast, none of the speakers at the rally even actually said the word COVID. Gabriel Artist raised some of the dire conditions teachers face but failed to mention that these were made possible by the union's suppression of any strike action uh, for over a decade and the agreements struck by the union with the government. Uh, the union's New South Wales secretary, Mark Morey, spoke for approximately one minute, most of which was chance. Uh, but in, in his speech, he also said, today is the start of industrial campaigning across the state to ensure everyone is paid appropriately, our kids are looked after, and the services are provided. Well, Maury's speech was actually the same as he's given at numerous industrial disputes over the past year, all of which were subsequently sold out by the union involved. None of the union's demands uh, that were advanced at the rally will address the issues teachers confront. And there were no concrete actions outlined for how a fight for education will and must be taken forward, precisely because the union has no intention of leading such a struggle. The unions have, in fact, collaborated with governments for decades to implement the attacks on education, resulting in disastrous conditions even before the COVID-19 pandemic. The Rudd and Gillard Labor governments of 2007 to 2013 initiated a series of pro-market reforms under the education revolution. In New South Wales, this include, or sorry, nationally, I should say, this included the implementation of the NAPLAN testing regime and in New South Wales, it took the particular form of local schools, local decisions, which opened the way for major cuts in school funding, the increase of casualization of teachers, and made principals responsible for hiring and firing. Now, in all of these measures, including NAPLAN, the unions have worked as an adjunct of the government, preventing teachers from taking up a fight. They have constantly invoked the anti-strike laws in the Fair Work Australia legislation, to justify why, why workers cannot take strike action. But the unions campaigned for these laws, which were implemented in 2009 as part of the Rudd government's attack on social conditions in the working class, of which the education revolution was a component. In fact, the fact the strike went ahead on Tuesday, despite the IR Commission's ruling, uh, demonstrate that these draconian measures will break apart as the working class begins to move. But for such a movement to go forward, workers must break from the unions, which are the main police force being used against them. As for the pseudo-left groups, I mean, they just act as the cheerleaders of the union, 
they were present, uh, but as well said absolutely nothing about COVID uh, and therefore are preventing any opposition developing to the government's attacks. Um, and the reason why they said nothing on about COVID is because they fundamentally agree with the union's demands that teachers go back to school under unsafe conditions. Just one example, in October, Red Flag, which is the publication of Socialist Alternative, published an article by Jerome Small titled, Just How Reckless is the Victorian School Reopening? As you read the article, it becomes clear that Small is not particularly concerned about how reckless uh, the reopening is, because near the end of it, he states, and I quote, each positive case is a small in a school is a threat to health, but it should also be an opportunity to learn what works and what doesn't, and to revise the approach, end quote. Now, this position is in line with the almost complete silence by the pseudo left on the pandemic. If an organization will not fight to defend the health and lives of workers, then they will not fight for anything. And in the pandemic, the unions are once again demonstrating that they are not workers' organizations, but the policemen for government and big business against the working class. And so we call for the creation of independent rank and file committees. And as our resolution that we've just adopted outlines for teachers to register to participate as uh, fully as possible uh, in the global workers inquest into the pandemic as a starting point for a broader struggle of the working class internationally. Thank you. Thanks very much for that report, Zach. Very helpful uh, and important. We'll move straight to the next uh, report, which is going to be delivered by Sue Phillips. Sue is the national convener of the Committee for Public, Edu public Education. Uh, she's a long-standing public school teacher working within the Victorian primary system for several decades now. She's also a long-standing member of the Social Equality Party and serves on the party's national committee. Uh, so we're very pleased to have Sue give the final report today. Welcome. Thanks, Patrick. And Thanks, Zach, for your contribution. And of course, I endorse what everyone said about the contribution by Evan, extremely important to have um, his participation. It's just now a month since our last CFPE online meeting on November the 13th. Everyone I'm sure will agree that the pace of change across the globe is extraordinary. We're living through unprecedented times, and as the World Socialist website has stressed, the pandemic is a trigger event that's enormously exposed and accelerated the already advanced economic, social, and political crisis of the capitalist system. At our previous meeting, we, we reported on the continued spread of Delta across Europe, the UK, and the US. Far from the pandemic abating, infections, hospitalizations, and deaths have increased with the global upsurge of COVID in schools, including here in Victoria and New South Wales. We warned at that meeting that infections would continue to grow in schools and in the population as a whole, as even the most basic uh, mitigations and health restrictions were being lifted with policies of herd immunity being adopted internationally, including in Australia. What has dominated government policies, fully endorsed by the unions, is an agenda of criminal indifference, of social murder, placing the drive for profit above human lives. At the time of our last CFPE meeting, we were not aware of the new Omicron variant. It hadn't been detected or named. However, it had been anticipated and warned of by scientists and health experts, and most importantly, pointed to by the World Socialist website, who on November the 21st initiated an urgent call for a, workers, a global workers' inquest into the pandemic. In that statement, we made the following critical point about what was about to emerge. We said, while powerful vaccines have been manufactured, only 41% of the world population has received two doses of the vaccine, in, including fewer than 7% of Africans and 3% of people in low income countries. Just 2.6% of the world's population has received the necessary third dose of the vaccine. 
scientists have repeatedly warned that continued mass infection amid slow rollout of vaccines creates evolutionary pressures that threaten to produce a vaccine resistant variant. Now, this is exactly what has happened. The inaction of governments, their malign neglect towards the working class, the most disadvantaged communities and the world's poor, and their vehement opposition to policies aimed at COVID elimination has led to the virus mutating into new and more infectious varieties that are becoming dangerous as warm. As Evan stressed, the purpose of the Global Workers Inquest is to document and expose the role of governments, the corporate elite, the media and the unions, uncovering the economic and political forces that allowed the uncontrolled spread of the virus. The inquest will hear from scientists, health experts and workers cutting through the lies, falsifications and misinformation that has led to the death of millions. The Australian government, both federal, state, Labor and Liberal, are in no way exception to these policies. How many times have educators and parents been told schools are safe, social distancing is not necessary, vaccines will provide the silver bullet, and if children get COVID, then it's only really mild. Like Biden in the US and Johnson in the UK, the Australian governments are completely on board with policies of letting it rip. 10 days ago, the National Cabinet, made up of all the state, territory and federal governments, unanimously agreed to basically do nothing to stop the Omicron variant from spreading. This was despite epidemiologists warning that the new strain of COVID was potentially the most infectious. The government leaders, the majority from the Labor Party, pledged to continue with the reopening of the economy as Delta infections continue to be recorded every day and cases of the new variant are detected. Decisions are being made, uh, being prioritised, not on the basis of the health and safety of children, students and working people, but on the demands of the corporate elite for the resumption of full profit making, especially over the Christmas and holiday season. In fact, far, far from raising concern about uh, Omicron, government ministers, senior officials and sections of the corporate media have proclaimed their desire for the new variant to spread. In a media conference after the National Cabinet, Paul Kelly, the Chief Medical Officer said, set the agenda, declaring his hope that Omicron is more transmissible, but less severe. He said, if this was the case, and there were mass infections, that would be his, quote, number one Christmas present. The front page of the Courier's Mail on November the 30th summed it all up. With three headlines, they read, friendly mutant, Christmas hope, Milder Omicron variant may replace deadly, deadly Delta and is Omicron a godsend? Such extraordinary comments are not confined to the right-wing Murdoch media, but a position espoused by others, such as Daniel Andrews, the Victorian State Labor Premier. In the past, Andrews was identified with lockdown measures instituted at times by his government under pressure from the working class and out of fear that the underfunded health system would collapse. Andrews himself was once described by Tony Abbott, past Liberal Coalition Prime Minister, as imposing a, quote, health dictatorship. Now Andrews is at the forefront of reopening the reopening economy. In a recent interview, Andrews declared, quote, we will, not, we will not be pursuing an Amicron zero policy here. We don't think that makes any, any sense. It might already be here. The good news so far is that whilst it might be more infectious, the evidence suggests that it might be milder, end of quote. 
in line with the political establishment and media internationally, Andrews is spreading misinformation in a concerted effort to sow complacency and disarm the population, prematurely declaring Omicron a milder variant. This is clearly not the case with infection rates soaring in South Africa as everyone went through, with children under two accounting for 10% of new admissions and skyrocketing infections doubling every second day in the UK and elsewhere, as Evan reported. So what's the situation here? Omicron is now spreading and has spread into several of the states with 42 cases that we know of in New South Wales, three in Victoria, others in Queensland, and now one in South Australia. Unsurprisingly, some of the first infections have been recorded in two schools in the working class suburbs of Sydney, developing into a cluster of over 20 students. The government announced, the New South Wales government had said on December the 15th that they're gonna further open up, don't need to do QR codes anymore, um, and masks uh, shouldn't be mandatory. Now, however, even before Omicron emerged, the Delta variant was spreading totally unhindered in schools across Victoria and New South Wales. At our last meeting a month ago, we reported that 540 schools had been closed or partially closed in Victoria and more than 300 in New South Wales due to COVID infections. That occurred in the first five weeks of the term. The latest figures compiled independently by the CFPE have continued to grow with more than 800 schools in Victoria and over 550 in New South Wales. We know this is a complete underestimation of the real situation with parents and teachers contacting us on a daily basis reporting new school exposure sites, predominantly but not uh, alone in primary schools. The extent of infections is consciously either underreported or not reported at all by the government and the unions, and only on occasions by the media, largely in response to the work of the CFPE. The aim is to hide the real situation and falsely present a picture of normalization attempting to sow illusions that everything is really fine. In Victoria, educational settings, as you can see on the graph there, settings far outstrip any other sector as the source of COVID clusters. Shockingly, more than 170 educational settings are now listed as clusters associated with more than 3,581 cases. Most clusters are in working class areas, including rural areas. The worst class cluster so far is at Morewood Park Primary School in the regional centre of the Latrobe Valley, which has only 400 students. The school has registered 80 COVID cases that began to emerge at the beginning of October in the first week of term after the lifting of statewide lockdown and health restrictions. All of these figures, the shocking and unending dangerous spread of the virus in schools, the lack of accurate information has been covered over by the teacher unions, the Australian Education Union, the New South Wales Teachers Federation and the Independent Education Union which have all been utterly complicit in this dangerous experiment, not only in the recent reopenings, but from the beginning of the pandemic in 2020. Until this day, there is no public information on how many educators and students have been infected by COVID, how many have been hospitalized, how many have been in ICU, and how many are suffering from long COVID. All of this is a secret and just one expression of the extraordinary censorship that has accompanied the reopening drive. At every turn, the unions have acted as the loyal messages of government dictates, desperately fighting to contain teacher concern and opposition 
in particular, attempting to silence and intimidate teacher members of the CFPE. Opposition exists amongst teachers, but they're being gagged and threatened not to speak out with the possibility of victimizations and loss of employment. Only the CFPE has provided teachers and parents with a voice, reporting their comments and holding regular meetings for discussion, unhindered by the anti-democratic and bureaucratic methods of the teacher unions. The terrible situation that has unraveled in schools this term has only, only was warned uh, only by the CFPE. In Victoria, the term began with thousands of years 11 and 12s forced back on site to sit exams under conditions of record infections in the community. As anticipated within days, infections began emerging in the schools, but staggered school returns of students continued and recklessly brought, were recklessly brought forward in both Victoria and New South Wales. Initially, government and department guidelines meant, meant once an infection was detected in school, staff and students were quarantined. This procedure quickly changed within weeks. Despite growing infections and in line with the lifting of an array of government health restrictions in the community as a whole, any closure of school was regarded by the government as an obstacle to corporate profit and had to be immediately changed. New depart department guidelines then meant no whole school closures, only a class or a cohort, leaving the majority of the school population to continue on site. There were no restrictions on family members to isolate and even some infected children who had other siblings continued to attend school. Contract tracing that previously had been carried out by the health department was now handed over to the schools and basically school principals allowed to interpret the guidelines however they like, pressured by the department to quote, keep schools open no matter what and don't necessarily alarm the community. This has meant whole school community events taking place at the end of the year, performances, graduations have proceeded leading to further infections. And on teachers who had contact with an infected ind individual for more than two hours had to, had, had to quarantine. If it was less than two hours, they didn't need to. Now, even if a teacher is designated a close contact, Schools, some schools that have been reported to us are advising teachers to be tested, but if they have no time to do that before the next day or can't immediately get the results, they should show up at school as they would be okay because they're being double vaxxed. In, in the vast majority of schools, there's no proper ventilation with schools having reported ventilators are not due in schools till April next year. And some schools have put out notices now appealing to parents to donate money to purchase ventilators. Some teachers have reported infections in schools, in six or more infections in one week, but the school, school is open. Others in specialist developmental schools have reported children attending class showing clear symptoms of COVID, not removed from the classes because they don't have designated areas for ill children and kept in classes all day infecting others and then put on a bus for more than an hour to be taken home. To even further guarantee schools remain open, the National Cabinet is using dubious Doherty Institute modelling to adopt a quote, and this is what Evan said in about the United States, to adopt a test to stay strategy that ensures children remain in schools while accepting a high probability of significant clusters resulting from a single case. The test to stay regime is now being implemented in Victoria and New South Wales and means that contacts with an infected person in a school only have to isolate until they receive a negative PCR test result 
before returning to school. Rapid antigen testing is then supposed to be conducted daily by the parents for the following week and results reported to the school. The families and households of an education contact do not need to isolate at all. Now, what we, what we do know about infections amongst children is this. Since the beginning of November, children under 10 have represented more than a quarter of all new cases. Under 30,000 children under the age of 10 have been diagnosed with COVID-19 and just over another 30,000 aged between 10 and 19. This represents 30% of all cases. Currently, between 5 and 6% of children in Australia with COVID-19 are hospitalised, and there is now growing numbers that, that are, are, have been admitted to intensive care. Now, this situation has left parents extraordinarily stressed and worried each day, deciding whether to send their children to school. Similar concern and anger over COVID in schools is being expressed by teachers, students and workers internationally. This is most sharply expressed in the UK school strikes that began on October 1 and continued, led by Lisa Diaz and other UK parents. Significantly, the UK school strikes were being organised outside the teacher unions winning growing international support. Out of desperation and in an attempt to silence Diaz and others, she is now facing legal, legal threats for not, um, not allowing her child to go to school. Two weeks ago, students and teachers, as Evan reported in Detroit at Martin Luther College, walked out and there are other reports of uh, teachers at other college in, colleges in Detroit preparing sick outs because of the unsafe conditions. But of course, the highest point and the most conscious political action taken to protect the lives of student, students and educators is the establishment of educator rank and file committees across the US, Europe, UK, Sri Lanka, Turkey, Brazil, and here. While organised walkouts and strikes are not emerging at this point here amongst teachers and parents, we know there are growing numbers of opposition and many teachers and parents are contacting the CFPE for support, information and a way forward. And we alone are providing teachers and parents with that. The strike that Zach went over of thousands of New South Wales teachers about appalling working conditions provides a small glimpse of what is to come. Yesterday, the federal government announced that five to 11 year olds will be eligible for a vaccine in January. And while we support such action, will it prove to be the silver bullet? Already the spread of Om Omicron makes clear that there is no viable strategy to stop the pandemic and save millions of lives other than a strategy of global elimination. This requires, as everyone has, has um, explained, and entails the combination of global vaccine production, distribution of the entire arsenal of public health measures, the closure of schools to in-person learning, and the shutdown of non-essential production, mass te testing and contract tracing, and the safe isolation of infected individuals. Of course, this means the creation of a massive multi-trillion dollar program to allow for the closure of schools and non-essential businesses, investment in testing and all the measures to, to quickly vaccinate the whole world. The implementation of such a strategy, however, requires the development of a mass social movement in the working class. The response to the virus must be taken out of the hands of the ruling class and in every workplace and factory and in the US and internationally, rank and file communities must be built to enforce the shutdown of unsafe facilities and this closure of schools. 
where workplaces remain open, safety committees must control conditions and ensure that workers are protected. Now, the development of such a move, mass movement against the policies of capitalist governments requires the education of workers and young people on the nature of the pandemic. And that, of course, is the purpose of the Global Workers' Inquest, which will play a role in providing such a social and political impulse for the mobilisation of workers internationally. So we appeal to everyone here today, as Evan has, to sign up in to, uh, to participate in the inquest and give evidence about your situation at your workplace in order to expose what has taken place on a world scale. Uh, thanks, Sue, for that report. Uh, I'd like to open up the meeting again. We don't have an enormous amount of time this afternoon, unfortunately, but as I raised at the beginning, uh, we encourage uh, questions, contributions, the sharing of experiences. Um, again, you can either use the chat box uh, to do that, or if you do wish to speak, you can raise your hand and I can potentially call on you. Um, I see during the report that was given, there was, uh, well, it's a rhetorical question, I guess, an important comment though from Cheryl Jones, all indications are that there are several weeks still before we know how severe Omicron will be. How can any medical advisor speak prematurely before scientists have studied and reported on it. Good point, thank you for that. Um, if there are other comments or questions, um, you can use the chat box or raise your hand. Perhaps while everyone in the meeting is thinking about that, I might throw to uh, Mandy, who's a teacher and member of the Committee of Public Education, has been very uh, centrally involved, very active in collating the the figures on the daily uh, numbers of schools affected. Um, Andy, do you want to speak on that just to add on to what Sue just raised? Yeah, hi. Um, thank you for that um, invitation to speak. Um, so, yeah, I just want to talk about the numbers that Sue um, did raise. We've now hit 824 schools in Victoria and 580 schools in New South Wales. Um, there's also schools in, AC, in the ACT that have been affected as well now. Um, and that's in term four alone. Um, so 10 weeks now that we're talking about. Um, to get these numbers, um, we've needed to scale Facebook and Twitter and media outlets, um, although very few are actually reported in mainstream media, despite noticing that our data was actually mentioned a few weeks ago. Um, we take numbers from the closures that are reported by the department daily. Um, these are getting fewer and fewer as less schools are, are closing, as we know. Um, and I note that this Thursday they weren't even listed, they, they weren't reported at all, um, and 10 were closed on Friday. We also collect from the cluster data that's been put on the websites of the additional COVID data. These list active cases of 10 or more. Again, Sue spoke a bit about that before. We've got the most clusters in educational settings and the highest numbers by far. Um, and because they're only listing active cases, they consider a case um, resolved after 10 days. So these numbers are then removed. So it's still not a very clear indication of what's really happening, um, which is why the CFPE has begun um, capturing the peak of those numbers to try and be a little bit more transparent in what's actually happening. Um, much of our data comes from concerned parents and teachers who write directly to us, um, often in response to our daily data reports and weekly full lists that are published on Saturdays. We've raised, um, we've raised before that the data is, is really difficult and getting harder to find. Um, and it's probably quite significantly underreported as the government's deliberately concealing the information to sell the schools a safe mantra. They know full well that, that they're not safe, but they need to be open to get parents back to work, which is why the work of the CFP is so important to give a better understanding of the actual impact on schools, um, along with the analysis that we've seen through the WS, WS and on Facebook and Twitter and, and at meetings such as this. Um, I just want to give... Um, a story, uh, just a, um, an example that I think highlights just how tricky the data can be. 
So I know of a, a state school um, in, in an area that's consistently identified as having the highest numbers of cases here in Victoria. Um, they've had over 30 cases reported informally to staff only. Parents were informed of the first cases and then they were told if they were considered a close contact. Um, um, staff were told of the room numbers as a matter of courtesy, as it says on each of the emails. Um, and they were told the rooms that are affected, but not numbers. At least 12 um, had been reported up until the morning where staff were told of the, the 30 plus cases. Um, it was a few days after that, that the school was listed on the cluster data set and they were listed as having 11 cases, despite knowing full well that there was more than 30. Um, the cases were identified as mainly in upper year levels at this stage, although they were present in younger grades as well. It was suggested that the three to six children was, were tested before returning to school, um, but there was no requirement that negative tests were shown before they came back to school. Um, on the same day, staff were asked to attend school and for provisions to be made for them to go and get tested throughout the school day, which means obviously that the groups of kids that did show up on that day, tested or not, were put together so that the staff could be released to go and get tested. Um, so additional cases were, were then identified through that process and, and continue to be afterwards. Um, I don't think that this is an extreme example. I think it's actually pretty typical of what's going on at schools. And I think it shows just how underreported um, the numbers are on official sites. Um, to finish, I just want to reiterate that the raw numbers, you know, 824 Victorian and 543 New South Wales um, schools, what that number really means, you know, each of those schools have, have several cases, several classrooms that are sent home to get tested. Staff members are needed to contact trace and inform parents and the department. And this is a really huge workload in an already ridiculously busy term four. Um, families have to miss work to get their kids tested. They return the next day, despite COVID sometimes taking seven to 14 days to be identified. Some use the RAT tests that Sue spoke about before. This is optional in Victoria. So, um, and even if it wasn't optional, it's not exactly accurate anyway. So cases continue to roll on, on in schools. Kids affect their family members, but most importantly, there are numbers of children who might have a, a mild case, might not, um, but absolutely risk the very real effects of, of, um, of long COVID. Um, this isn't sustainable. Um, children won't be fully vaccinated at the beginning of the school year next year. So we can expect that this will continue in term one. Some private schools are now able to give the option of remote learning while public schools are, are not um, afforded the same um, choice. So I think the work that you know the CFP are doing, educating the public and particularly parents and, and educators is really, really important. So Thanks to everyone here and yeah, for their contributions. Thanks, Manny. That was important. Um, there was a comment, related comment from Cheryl Jones again. Uh, there is next to nil transparency in Shepparton, also about local data. And I'm sure Shepparton isn't unique in that regard either. Uh, there was a question earlier in the chat regarding uh, ventilators or air, air filtration systems in New South Wales schools um, and Erica replied by saying quote the position of the department is that HEPA filters are unapproved open windows and doors schools are placing cheap filters in some areas of the school in what appears to be an attempt to allay fears uh, but I think uh, in adding to that answer uh, Carolyn has raised her hand and can speak now. Um, thanks Patrick yeah so it it is indeed I mean the New South Wales government um, uh, commissioned a report from a company that specialises in ventilation to have a look at the ventilation in New South Wales schools. And like the Doherty report that Sue referenced, um, this report was commissioned for a particular reason and has um, shown that actually, um, and claims to show that natural ventilation in schools is enough. But of course, um, it has many, many assumptions that are, 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 are breached um, including opening doors and windows, um, but also te temperature inside and outside and, um, and amount of window space compared to 
um, floor space in each of the classrooms. So, so the New South Wales government's position is indeed that HEPA filters are unnecessary. And my understanding is that in Victoria, they are, even though they've been built, uh, bought, they're only being placed in very high uh, density places like uh, libraries and uh, staff rooms. And certainly they're not being rolled out in general at schools across the state or indeed um, in New South Wales. I mean, you know, Evan um, spoke of, and we've have spoken many times about and reported on the website many times about the fact that, um, you know, scientists have known for a long time that um, COVID-19 is an aerosol spreader and that it requires, um, you know, that the deep cleaning really will do, will do nothing, as Evan said, that it's really all about um, good ventilation and, um, and protecting um, yourself from uh, aerosol droplets. Um, and, um, and so ventilation is a, a very important mitigation process as, are, as, the, as the World Socialist website in, in their last meeting uh, raised, as are wearing good quality, high quality masks. But it does sort of draw out the fact that even though um, the state governments understand, um, you know, the dangers that are being posed to children, um, really, the health and well-being of children, their families, their educators um, comes very much second to um, to the you know the government's um, wanting to provide businesses with the opportunity to to, to uh, generate profit. Um, you know the consideration of the health of children is uh, second to um, the economic considerations and 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 profit for the for the ruling elite. So I think. I don't know whether that answers the question, but yeah, that's the situation with filters in New South Wales. And of course, we are seeing, like Victoria, many, many um, outbreaks that are repeatedly happening in schools where, uh, you know, some schools are closing five or six times in the space of two weeks as various different years uh, supposedly go into isolation only for another infection to pop up and uh, clusters are being created. Um, you know, associated with schools. I heard the other day something that, that is not being advertised and is not um, is not you know publicised anywhere that uh, a school in um, the mid coast of mid, mid north coast of New South Wales has now got at least forty cases associated with it. Um, anyway, uh, so I hope, hope that sort of answered the question. But I mean, I guess one of, probably one of the things I would say most importantly is that. You know what we need to do is eradicate this virus that we need to fight for mitigation for proper mitigation measures to be in place but I, I think probably one of the things that has been emphasized by all of the speakers is that um, the most important thing we one of the most important things that we can do to stop the spread is to close the schools and I, I, that's you know we need proper mitigation measures across society we need lockdowns where necessary we need masking we need all the non sort of medical intervention things happening, but an important ingredient of that is the closing of schools. Thanks. Thank you, Carol. Um, just to add one point with regard to the air filtration issue. I mean, this is a class issue as, as is every issue within the education sector. Uh, in Victoria, the state government announced, uh, I can't remember now, it's a long time ago, to great fanfare that they were going to uh, purchase 51,000 air filtration systems, give those to public schools, so sort of lower income uh, Catholic schools as well. Uh, the last time we held a public meeting, the CFPE, there was 3% of those had actually been, 3% of the 51,000 had actually been delivered. I haven't got the latest figures on hand, but it's surely not much higher. I know that in many schools, there isn't a single air filtration system developed uh, or, or delivered rather. Um, I teach in a, school in a working class area of Melbourne in the northern suburbs, which has, you know, during the second wave was amongst the worst affected suburbs. Uh, school there has no air filtration system whatsoever, and there's no news as to when that may be developed. With private schools, of course, they're not waiting. Those schools with the resources are, are using their own resources, their own uh, delivery chains, etc., cetera, uh, to take the necessary measures to improve their air quality. Even I know, I know of at least one public school in a, in a fairly sort of affluent middle-class suburb where parents just chipped in and, and bought 
uh, air filtration systems for each classroom. That's obviously a privilege that uh, schools in, in poorer working class areas can't afford. So again, the sort of deep, deep inequalities within the education system has been exposed by this uh, pandemic. We do have a couple of other comments in the chat box from Kate and Cheryl again. So thank you for those raising some important points. I am mindful of time. Unfortunately, we have less time for the discussion than we normally do have. If anybody wishes to make any final comments or ask any final questions, then you can do that now. Uh, so do you wanna make any points on any of these issues or Zach? No, I think the points that were, you know, comrades had made are really important. I mean, you know, one can see the sort of process. I mean, you know, what we've mainly reported on um, with the CFPE is the situation in the schools with Delta. Um, and we know that, you know, all the indications are is that Omicron is far more infectious and vaccines by themselves do not protect people. Um, so, you know, we're at the end of the school year, there will be a break of several weeks, but we're going to go back into a situation where Omicron has spread, you know, in the community, community far more widely. So the fight that we've taken forward, you know, for the establishment of independent safety committees and so on is, is, is more urgent than ever. And of course, you know, as everyone's promoted the significance and the importance of the inquest to provide information for workers and teachers and so on in order to defend themselves. So I think, you know, I think the discussion has been very important um, and re very revealing of the situation that we confront that is not on the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald or the Age or any other paper. We are going to move to the next agenda items and um, they are important ones. So I just encourage everyone to participate in this final stage of the meeting. Uh, firstly, we wish to show a video from uh, Britain. Uh, Sue referenced Lisa Diaz, who's a, a parent in England. Uh, she has initiated a school strike campaign where she and uh, others are withdrawing their children each Friday as a protest against the extraordinary neglect of the situation in the schools in Britain. Um, this is uh, the school strike 2021 is the, the social media hashtag um, and she's formed a group to organize independently of the unions and the official parties in Britain uh, to organize resistance to this you know, endangerment of, of children. And now she's facing a threat as she explains in this video. This is a letter from Wigan Council. As you can see, there's the Wigan Council um, headed paper, basically saying if I don't send my daughter into school where there is COVID already, that I um, will face court proceedings. I can face a family court, which is particularly ma malicious because it implies there's a welfare issue, like I'm neglecting my daughter or she is under threat um, or something like that. Um, and legal proceedings um, where I can get fines of up to £2,500. And this is because I am keeping my daughter out of school and I am teaching her remotely until it is made safe. That schools aren't safe is not a matter of debate. In fact, if I wanted to spread an airborne virus around um, a, a, through a population, I would stick 30-odd uh, unvaccinated bodies in a confined space, in a classroom, um, without masks, without social distancing, with inadequate and unmeasured ventilation. Open a door and window, weather permitting, it is not enough. It's not enough against Delta, it's certainly not enough against Omicron. I would not isolate close contact, so your child could be sat next to a child whose sibling, mum or dad, is poorly, is at home with Covid. All of these things is creating a perfect storm for the pr spread of COVID. Now you might say, oh, but it's only the sniffles in kids. That is absolutely wishful thinking. 
Chris Whitty said it's not a benign illness in children. Fauci said children need to be vaccinated for themselves, not to protect other people, well that as well, but to protect themselves. We've got 80,000 children living with long COVID in the UK. 13,000 of these children have been poorly for over a year. 115 children have died throughout the course of the pandemic of COVID in the UK and there is nothing being done about it, nothing whatsoever. So this attack on a vulnerable mum, I don't think people realise how serious and how cynical it is. You know, it's like the expression, isn't it? First they came for the socialists, but I was not a socialist. And then they came for the Jews, I was not a Jew. And then they came for me, but there was no one left to defend me. That's a video from uh, Lisa Diaz's uh, Twitter account which is used to publicize the campaign both within Britain and internationally. So it's clearly a very serious threat that's been issued against her by the local council, uh, potentially threatening fines and worse, uh, accusing her totally falsely of, of neglect. Um, and so through the World Socialist website we're mounting the international defense campaign. Um, and so as part of that we are seeking to get everyone's endorsement here of this defense resolution which reads, this meeting of the CFPE declares its full solidarity with Lisa Diaz, who has been persecuted by the UK government and Wigan's Labour Run Council for her struggle against the mass infection of students with COVID-19. The authorities are threatening to prosecute Lisa with a fine of up to £2,500 and the family court because she refuses to risk the lives of her children by sending them into COVID-infested schools. Lisa's call for a global strike wave Global school strike was supported by educators and workers in Australia and internationally, underscoring that we face the same struggle. We strongly denounce the UK government's stepped up intimidation of parents who refuse to send their kids into dangerous schools and pledge to do all in our power to build support for Lisa among educators, parents and students in Australia. Uh, so that's the resolution. Tech team, we're gonna do a poll or we're gonna just vote via the chat box again. Okay, so we've got the votes in and all of those who've voted are in favour, so that's unanimous. Thank you very much everyone who's voted. So we'll submit that resolution both to Lisa Diaz and we'll also consider uh, sending it to the Wigan Council to make them aware that their harassment of, of this uh, parent is being followed internationally. You know, also encourage everyone to log on to social media. If you're on Twitter, connect with uh, the CFPA of course, but also with Lisa Diaz, that's a Twitter handle there, Sandy Boots 2020, you can see at the top of the, the link. All right, we do have some final announcements that we're gonna uh, move through fairly effectively. Um, I'd like to encourage everyone here to consider, if you're not already, making a donation to the Socialist Quality Party and to the work of the World Socialist website, which in turn supports the work of the Committee for Public Education. Um, so if you're an Australian resident, you can donate to the Socialist Quality Party via that link. On the, uh, on the panel that you can see there. If you're an international viewer, uh, international participant, you can donate via the World Socials website. We don't get any big business donations. We don't get uh, big funding from the state. We rely for our activities on the generous, regular support uh, of the working class, where every month we take up a collection, a monthly fund collection, in which you know, workers from across the country give very generously. Uh, to support the necessary work um, of our international movement. Uh, we assist the work of our comrades in, in different parts of Asia. We support the daily development of the World Socialist website, which is the world's most widely read socialist publication. Um, and we are very active in different sections of the working class, including, of course, as is evident in the education sector. We might move along to the next slide, uh, which is an important sale that's now uh, being offered by Marion Books. Marion Books is the Socialist Quality Party's publishing arm. Uh, Marion Books Australia, you can see the website there, marion.com.au. We have a holiday sale, 20% off, uh, which is a, a substantial saving on some of our, uh, well, all of our publications, sorry. Um, some of them you can see there on that slide. So I'd encourage everyone to log on to marion.com.au after this uh, meeting. Um, you can find books to build your own personal Marxist library and also books to purchase potentially for presents for friends, family and so on. I would like to draw your attention to two titles in particular. Um, one is a new book by the late Russian sociologist and historian Vadim Rogovin. Uh, you can see that there. This is a newly translated 
publication from Mary Books just out. Um, as you can read there, it's the first in a seven volume series by the Russian Marxist historian on the history of the Soviet Union uh, between 1922 and 1940. Uh, the new publication deals with the emergence of the left opposition, the emergence of Leon Trotsky uh, and the left opposition struggle against uh, Joseph Stalin and the emergence of the counter-revolutionary bureaucracy in the Soviet Union. Of course, as socialists, it's a very frequent question that we field. What happened in the Soviet Union? How do you uh, advocate a Marxist perspective today, given the disaster, given the mass murder that occurred in the Soviet Union? Well, the answer to that is that what happened in the Soviet Union under Stalin had nothing to do with communism or Marxism. It actually represented a repudiation of a Marxist perspective. And in order to consolidate its rule, the Stalinist bureaucracy had to um, repress and murder hundreds of thousands of genuine Marxists, uh, the most conscious and principled and determined of whom uh, was Leon Trotsky. And so this book by Vladimir Govin deals with this history, which is a really critical one, um, especially the origins of the left opposition, the very principled and courageous manner in which uh, the left opposition fought against uh, the Stalinist bureaucracy in the 1920s, and then subsequently took that struggle forward into the establishment of the Fourth International, of which our movement is the contemporary uh, representative of. The other book then is uh, on the 1619 Project, the New York Times 1619 Project, and the Racialist Falsification of History. Uh, this is a publication compiling essays and interviews, including with major American historians, uh, exposing uh, a really right-wing racialist uh, characterization of American history, seeking to present the American Revolution as a attempt to prop up slavery in the United States um, against the noble efforts of the British Empire uh, to abolish it, supposedly. Um, we don't have time to get further into the politics of the 1619 Project, but I'd very much encourage everyone to uh, consider ordering that book. Uh, it's really crucial politically to understand the role of identity politics, not just in the United States, but internationally. And it really clarifies the basis of a objective approach to history, which has developed there. A couple of final announcements. Uh, tomorrow, we have a really important meeting, which I'd encourage everyone here to register for and attend. Uh, it's a meeting of the Socialist Equality Party, particularly focused on health workers. So it's a forum aimed at developing a discussion within the health industry, uh, appealing to doctors, nurses, uh, medical researchers, others in the um, healthcare industry who have obviously been at the forefront of the, uh, you know, well, efforts to minimise the disastrous death toll, both in Australia and internationally amid the pandemic, uh, but also at the forefront of the neglect of national governments being needlessly exposed uh, to this virus, needlessly forced to endure um, terrible working conditions. Um, and so this public forum tomorrow uh, will contain important reports, as this meeting has, um, an outline of perspective through which health workers can turn out to other sections of the working class, including teachers and educators, and really you know, advance an independent uh, political perspective to defend their independent interests. Uh, so that's tomorrow at four o'clock um, Australian Eastern time. Um, hopefully the link will be posted there. Yes, thank you, Julia. You can click on that link there to register for tomorrow's meeting. And finally, I would encourage everybody here, if you're not already, uh, to become an electoral member of the Socialist Equality Party. Uh, recently, for those who don't know, the Australian Parliament rushed through in record speed uh, new anti-democratic electoral laws uh, supported by the Labor Party, uh, Labor and Liberal parties. And amongst other things, these electoral laws served to force uh, parties that don't currently have representation in Parliament, force them to increase the number of members which they have to submit to the Australian Electoral Commission from 500 to 1,500. Failure to submit an additional 1,000 members, names, addresses, personal details, failure to do that would mean that those parties, including the Socialist Equality Party, would not be a federally registered party. What that means is that when you are standing as a candidate in an election, if you're federally registered, that means you have your party name on the ballot paper. So people can identify who you are and vote in a conscious uh, and informed manner. Uh, what this is seeking to do is to remove parties from the ballot paper 
remove working class people's right to vote for a socialist candidate by stripping existing parties of their electoral uh, registration. Now, not only was the increase from 500 to 1,500 members part of this law, they also in imposed a 90 day deadline amidst the conditions of a pandemic. So amidst a pandemic in which it's, it's unsafe and in many places illegal to do face-to-face -face campaign work within the working class as we otherwise would, we were forced uh, to attempt this uh, project amidst uh, this, this really dangerous pandemic. So it really does represent an outrageous attack on the democratic rights of all working people, these electoral laws. We have a very important statement, which has just gone up on the World Socialist website earlier today, noting that we, the party has not met uh, this arbitrary, arbitrary requirement of submitting the details of one and a half thousand members within the December 2nd deadline. However, that we are pursuing this campaign. We're not letting this uh, stand and we are gonna take this fight forward. We are gonna continue to uh, recruit electoral members. Electoral membership means that you agree with the essential program um, of the Socialist Quality Party, agree to have your uh, electoral details submitted to the Australian Electoral Commission as part of our registration drive. Um, and so I'd encourage everyone here to submit the form, um, which you will find via a link that I'm sure will be posted in the chat box. The link to the statement has just been posted. Uh, so it's very important if you can assist us with this. If you're an Australian, you do have to be an Australian citizen. You do have to be on the Australian electoral roll or at least um, willing to become so. Um, in order to become an electoral member. Finally, those of you who are already electoral members, I would encourage you to consider becoming a full member of the Socialist Quality Party. That is based on a uh, thorough review, assessment of and agreement with the Statement of Principles. Uh, that document you can see there, it's available uh, from Mary Books. Finally, just before everybody leaves, I'd encourage you to leave your contact details with us if you haven't already. Make sure you're following the Committee for Public Education uh, social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and so on. Uh, make sure you're on our email list. Um, and we look forward after the summer break to resuming uh, political activity. Not that we suspend operations over the summer break, by the way. Uh, we are continuing to fight for the widest clarification within uh, the working class, including amongst teachers, uh, term time or not. Uh, but certainly the school year as it begins in January, February, uh, 2022 will be an increasingly fraught one given the spread of Omicron. So um, our collective work will take on an even greater urgency then. With that, we'll wrap up the meeting. I thank everybody here for your uh, participation and attendance. Um, wish you a happy holidays and um, see you next time. Thank you very much.